Welcome, everybody, to Night of the Nerdy Laser. This is our interview segment of the YouTube channel, and we are uh, we are rolling along. We're trying to find people that are interesting that we would like to talk to because we think you guys would like to hear it. So uh, this week we have somebody very awesome in the YouTube community that our buddy Jeff Lown right over here. Found. Uh, I am Richard, as always, uh, and you can listen to Night of the Nerdy Laser on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that as a just a podcast where it's completely different content. So uh, I guess uh, I'll let you introduce uh, our guest, uh, uh, Jeff, and then uh, we'll go from there, buddy. Yeah, so I'm Jeff, as Richard said, and today we're joined by a very special guest, uh, creator, uh, does everything for it, uh, awesome YouTube channel, uh, and I know him, I think, from Facebook and some of the groups there, uh, but we're joined by Ryan Verrill. Ryan, how are you? Doing all right. It's a, it's a long day, it's, but uh, yeah, I'm here and happy to be here. Awesome. I understand the long day, and I thought this com this camera was rolling, and it wasn't. So I was just talking to uh, my uh, folding chair over here off to the side. It looked professional, Sorry. though. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, if if I'm anything, it's professional, Ryan. So um, so you are uh, you know, your YouTube channel is Disc Connected, which is a great name, and I what I love about it is it's all about physical media, and that's what we uh, we are big supporters of physical media uh we buy a lot of the current stuff from um all the vinegar syndromes uh grindhouse releasing synapse you look like you have a few <laughs> there i don't have the only thing i have is my uh weekend at bernie on vhs <laughs> weekend of bernie's two uh thank you um <laughs> that's the only thing i have laying around right now but nice. uh but uh yeah so what got you uh how long have you been doing the youtube channel uh gosh the youtube channel itself uh again covid time has made everything weird because it <laughs> it feels good. like it's april like 727th of 2020 still uh <laughs> i i think the actual channel launched in march or april of 2021 i think i gotcha so not too not too long ago i mean no um but uh i mean what made you want to start something that focused on physical media uh well i've kind of always not always obviously but uh since i was a young teenager I, i've collected physical media in various different formats everything from cassettes and compact discs and super cheap vinyls uh vhs collection with my parents and then moving out of my own and going oh they have dvd players and trying to buy all those that i could and then uh you know, decades go by. One of the things that uh, really set off some of this current phase of collecting is my wife and I moved from California to Kansas City, Missouri, and I sold off 99.2% of all of my physical media. So I only kept wow. a couple of the really important ones uh, just to be able to finance the move because it was a basically it was a desperation move. And uh, once I got out here and got my feet under me, it was oh, well, now it's the perfect time for Blu-rays. So it was a really easy transition from DVD to Blu-ray because I didn't have much left. Um, yeah, so I started that. And uh, around 2014, 2015, uh, we had our first kid. And we, you know, I spent a lot more time at home watching movies with a baby asleep on my stomach where I'm not allowed to move. So started getting more and more into physical media again and collecting and then uh, as time went on, I wanted to do something online with it. And one of my biggest things is I saw how many people were posting information that was just straight wrong. Uh, you know, telling people that something was region locked when it was region free or, um, the amount of times I've seen people say that something was out of print when you could actually get it on, you know, five different websites for less than 10 bucks. It was just infuriating. So, I started uh, real simply with an Instagram and I maybe even a Facebook account then just to sort of share information, fun shelf pictures, whatnot. And then uh, then COVID came and I immediately went, I'm really bored and I feel like maybe I could take this to some sort of next level. And that's where the channel came in. And it's a little bit easier to communicate that way rather than in a, you know, 
character limited Instagram post. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's it's better than a podcast in a way. I mean, you got, you know, you do unboxings and uh, that works out really good with YouTube. So um, what is uh, the feedback been from when you got your from from since you've been doing the channel? Um, it depends. Uh, I, I look at everything in a, a few different eras. Uh, at first, I was very awkward just getting my feet under me um we were talking That's off where air. i am <laughs> oh, yeah. we were uh we were talking off air i work for the government and one of the things i do is uh training both in person and over uh you know video basically for a lot of people so i got into this groove of being super monotone not having a whole lot of personality speaking very government professionally and that was very obvious uh, for the first <laughs> 23 videos I did, at least probably. Uh, yeah, I, I would not have bet against me possibly having an actual stick in my ass for those first 20 episodes. <laughs> it was not great. It was like a lecture. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> and, and that's kind of how I approached it, which made it worse because it was very yeah. educational. Um, so it, I could see how it was very dry at first. Uh, but then the personality started to come out and I started turning to live shows. Uh, I now do a live show every single Thursday and I've oh. started that, I think, August of 2021. And I since then, I've only ever missed one Thursday. And that's because I was in California for uh, Monster Palooza. So I, I think that I deserve a little pass for that weekend. Um <laughs> But uh, also that live show is now sharing all of the announcements that I post. So every single Thursday, it is a good hour to, I think the longest one's about four and a half hours of all of the boutique announcements that came out wow. that entire week. And uh, I mean, you mentioned podcast. It also comes out as an audio podcast the following oh, that's day. Cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's kind of like us. We put our podcast on YouTube uh, as well because if yep. you're doing the content you might as well utilize exactly two different uh you know channels we went the uh, other route with it know. though we went audio then we're like you know what let's go ahead and do that video <laughs> yep. too we'll yeah. just go ahead and take care of it well yeah. i've been podcasting for like 12 years jeff so and i'm still <laughs> nowhere <laughs> yeah well i hear you i'm right there with you so um so what i mean i know you like the the boutique stuff um vinegar syndrome and stuff but let's talk movies like what got you into movies when you were a kid like what are some of your favorites is horror a, your favorite genre um uh if we brought action, in that comedy if, if we brought in horror to cult i i would probably say that's the case because uh horror exploitation uh some of the old black exploitation a lot of the old cheesy action flicks, a lot of that lumped together, sure. Uh, yeah. Very very similar in tone, at least. Uh, younger, I I really came into it fairly early. My parents showed me Halloween when I was like eight years old. <laughs> Scared the crap out of me. Uh, and that, that was a good starting place. And then just starting to branch out from there. Unfortunately, I grew up in a very small town, so they didn't have a lot of these deep cuts. It was mostly, you know, the the brand new releases at blockbuster that i was able to to get access to but once i became an adult and realized there was a world outside of this tiny town and uh the biggest thing is i was in the music scene for a while so i was hanging out with some of these bands and they'd be like oh uh yeah we we have this song that's uh played off of evil dead and you know and i'm like wait what's evil dead and they're like what do you mean what is evil dead <laughs> and so they would share the movie with me literally because i hosted bands at my house to play to just sleep for a night and a lot of those interactions really started kickstarting like, oh, not only should I be buying music, but there is like 8 billion movies I've never heard of. I should probably go figure <laughs> those out. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. I'm trying to yeah. catch up. Um, <laughs> Jeff likes the nunsploitation. That's that's one of his is really good. Yeah, yeah. A lot of we've uh, we've been blessed with a lot of good uh, nunsploitation releases this last Box year. Also. And stuff. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm in this weird TV movie phase, which is kind of difficult to like figure out like the TV movies, but there's a bunch uh, that are getting, I think that's going to become a thing here in the next few years. And I uh, yep. can't remember who released it, but they had that tell tel terror te of television or something like that. Tell I don't know what it is. Tell by Sarah. That's it. Uh, that's I was going to buy it. Too. Yeah. I, I saw it the other day at grindhouse but i uh it was 
sixty dollars, so I yep. need it to be cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll put it on my Christmas list. Although my <laughs> wife hates physical media, so she hates all that stuff behind you, which I have out in my room. She can't stand it. I was <laughs> I was telling Jeff I was hooking up a Blu-ray player downstairs to the our projector, and she was like, "She's the one that unplugged it," <laughs> and she's not too happy <laughs> that I plugged it back in. So, um. So what what are your feelings about horror now? Like, um, maybe not even just horror, but I mean, even stuff like, I mean, you know, you got Quentin Tarantino and you got so many directors out there, uh, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is one of my favorites. I was talking to a friend of mine today about it who hadn't seen it yet. I'm going to let him borrow it with physical media and uh, probably never see it again. Cause that's usually <laughs> what happens. But uh, I mean, like what are your thoughts about right now? Cause we, we got barbarian and Pearl and X and all this coming out. Like where do you see like horror and the genre, even the cult genre now? Cause I mean, X is completely a cult movie too. Um, Cause it rips off, older stuff you of course. Know, maybe not rips off but you know pays on stylized yeah <laughs> yeah um i i first of all I, I think it is a banner year for horror I, I think in modern times this is the best year we've had in the last five or six years just for horror specifically uh i also think it's just straight a very good year for movies overall and i unfortunately a lot of that is probably due to Everybody can suddenly film what they've been able to stew on for the last few years from the pandemic. So uh, yeah. their best ideas got worked and worked and worked, and now they can get them out there. And that makes it good for us. But then next year, we I feel like we might have some higher expectations, and they may not be able to live up to that. But uh, movies in general are, I, I mean, I think almost... Uh, great at least in in terms of five or eight a year are uh damn near instant classics but the the hard part right now is i feel like we have not seen movies improve for oh we'll say about 20 years i i feel like we're in a little bit of a stagnant zone uh on the other hand, if you look at TV, I feel like TV has improved over the last 10 years and improved exponentially over the last 10 years before that. That's I, I agree. That's, yeah, that's a good point because I mean, you know, you, you well, you have movie stars doing TV now too. Yep. Which used to be like the sin. Like you never right. did that as a movie star. That that was seen as a as a backtrack, but you know, you have so many good television shows out there. I mean, Stranger Things and Handmaid's Tale, and I mean you could name a hundred movies probably of Squid Game and all that. And I think you're right. Movies really haven't kind of I don't know what the next step for movies is. Yeah. But uh I mean we're not really because technology, you know, people don't really like technology <laughs> in movies. They don't really like 3D. They don't really like the speed racer kind right. of thing. Um, you know, so I mean, the last time I feel like I mean, you know, you had the Matrix that changed everything. And I yep. mean, but that was 22 Not, years ago, 23 years ago. Yeah, the year 1999 just pretty much, they, I think I mentioned that book before, like the greatest film year ever, 1999, yep. was just, there was just so much going on that year that it did change the entire landscape of movies and kind of where we went with it. And we kind of rode that in. And if we're going to just talk horror specifically, I would say we kind of like went into like the indie stuff, like after that, like the 07 through like, you know, whatever, 20, 2013. Foreign we had, stuff, foreign yeah, stuff, really dove yeah. into there. Yeah. Um, I guess to kind of steer it away so much from horror specific, Ryan, what would you say, how do you, how do you see physical media um, still playing a part um, in today's society and kind of, what are, what are viewers? It, it's, I feel like, you know, we had the huge DVD boom where everybody was buying physical media. Where, where would you say we're at now with that? Hmm. Uh, I have multiple times on my channels called it the golden age and I've sort of, uh, walked that back a little bit. I think that to explain it as a golden age takes a little more nuance in the way that we, uh, formulate how that phrase comes across nowadays, because, it is less than it was prior, obviously. It's more niche. It's more collector-focused. However, I think that we have never seen anything as high quality as we're getting right now. Uh, this is 
this is the era of you know mantle lab one clicks coming out of china that are just mind-bogglingly beautiful they they are incredible uh this is the era of you know buying a 4k film from the 1920s that will yeah you know it, it's it is better than it was ever shown in any theater and you can watch it at home on a shitty black friday tv and it looks <laughs> way better than it was ever projected i mean that alone is astounding but uh the fact that we have this sort of battle going on and uh i dropped an interview today and it, we talked about this or off screen just slightly but uh with Fran Simeone from uh, the newly announced Radiance Films. And one of the things we talked about is how these boutique labels are catering to essentially two different crowds, but also making their money from a third crowd. So the, the two crowds they're presenting to are the collectors and the film fans. And the good boutique labels are able to successfully please both of those groups. But then the ones that are going to keep making money are the ones that are feeding this third one that are going to find it on shelves in something like Grindhouse Video or, you know, Radiance Films. They have HMVs in the UK, uh, JB Hi-Fi in Australia, all these other places. And unfortunately, in the US, that's not as much of a thing anymore. Um, if you're Aero Video or Shout Factory, you might get some stuff in a Best Buy. But, I mean, there's something like 20% of Best Buys don't have any movie sections anymore. Yeah, that's um, pretty much mine. So I went to Knoxville the other day. I live right outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. <clears throat> and I went specifically because Best Buy has some pretty sweet uh, steel books, like exclusives and stuff. And I see a lot of TikToks where they, they find stuff. So I was like, well, I'm off today. I'll go over there and look. Yeah. Not a single movie anywhere. They, they, my, it's my, depressing. in Knoxville, like it's a big city. Right. Um, Good news is Grindhouse Video is about five miles down the road, but uh, <laughs> you know, and we also have the dungeon here in Maryville. Orbit is about two hours away, so really, right now, Tennessee is a great location for like all the all the cool stuff. That's yeah, happening. I just I actually just went out there to visit because I'm here in Colorado, so I went nice. out there to visit Richard and uh, our other co-host Matt, and. We, we hit the meccas. We went to all, all the places. A lot of driving, but it was worth it just to kind of go in there, you know, get a feel of what what yeah. a physical store is. You know, we we I guess almost in a way, it seems like we've kind of taken them for granted because now everything we just grab online. And that's right. great. It's wonderful for someone like me where I don't have those stores. But when you could walk in there. You, you end up walking out spending 100 to $200 on stuff you might not have done online because you're like, yep. well, I'm here. I might as well grab it. But <laughs> it's totally worth it every time, I say. Agreed. <laughs> and now you got that other Mecca opening in Denver. You got the archive. Uh, yeah, I do. That's that's going to be a nice hour and a half drive and a uh, couple hundred dollars uh, lighter in the pocket every couple <laughs> weeks, I think. Yep. God, am I gonna have to come to Pueblo? <laughs> no, don't come to Pueblo. Just, just fly into Denver. And just hang fly out to there. Denver. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Yeah, uh, you were talking about like beautiful sets. I mean, like some of my favorites are um, Fan of the Phantom of the Mall uh, and Beastmaster and a New York Ninja. Do you have some favorites? Those are kind of more mainstream, just because I don't veer in some of the uh, those other labels. But do you have some that are your favorites? Um, well, first off, uh, for those on YouTube, you can see this is just one small corner of my releases behind me. I've got too, too many. Um, if we were to narrow it down to a specific label, I could easily call out a few, but, um, I, I love vinegar syndrome. So pretty much anything from them. Uh, they really are great. I love the vast majority of their partner labels. Um, they do. It's basically the same work, just different styles of films. Arrow Video's got some great ones. One of my favorites over the last couple of years is Django. That 4K release is oh, yeah. remarkable. Uh, to see a film from 1966 look like it was filmed you know, a decade ago with a brand new 2018 interview with Franco Nero, with him remembering stories from 1966 like they were yesterday. Awesome. It's just astonishing to see something like that get released. Yeah, I still and, haven't made the move to 4K. I just, I, I just haven't. Um, do it I now while it's early on save yourself some money so you're not double triple dipping on everything <laughs> well, well so the good thing is is i mean i have a lot of 4ks now because a lot of the 4ks come out they have the blu-rays so i just right. buy the 4k so that's really amazing i think and and uh 
but I, I just really wish movies would come with digital codes as well <laughs> for yeah. free. Uh, I just really, I, cause I love my digital catalog as well. Um, I mean, I fear the day that when voodoo is no longer a thing, cause I will instantly lose 150 titles, right. but, um, you know, but I, I just dig digital too. Um, but there's something about that physical media that uh, it's just hard to ignore. Agreed. I uh, One of the big things for me with these boutique releases is the special features, obviously. With digital stuff, we rarely ever get those. That's you, true. Yes. One out of 25 releases, they might throw a commentary or one special feature making of something. But uh, I, I dive into those like it's film school, literally. I... I uh, I watch the movie. I'll try to watch as many special features as my wife, who is watching with me, has now fallen asleep <laughs> and is slobbering on my arm. So I'll I'll have some of those playing, and then as soon as that's done, I'll read the the if there's a booklet, I'll read the entire booklet as well. And with some of these, they lead into other types of things. Uh, Django was a good example. The booklet that came with that had essentially two sections in it: one about the Django franchise and how there's like 90 movies associated with the name Django. <laughs> that none of them related actually. And then the second half was with uh, the director Corbucci and how he had such this massive effect, however, was overshadowed by Sergio Deloni. So, uh, or De Leone. So it was a, a really good way to learn about all kinds of context behind that release. And gosh, I mean, so many of these vinegar syndrome partner labels are doing booklets now that it's uh, giving things that I never had an insight to that. I can read the booklet and just say, well, damn, now I want to go learn about, you know, the the Chinese occupancy of Taiwan in the 80s. And I've literally <laughs> done that with certain releases yeah. because there's films about that. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm really glad you brought up the extras and special features because that is like a game changer. You, you, I kind yeah. of think back to DVD. I didn't have so much interest in the extras as i did and but dvds always had those in some of them were those like fun kind of easter egg like yep go look over here open this door on this menu and then you could find the trailer oh, or something like that. that so the the gimmick was there so that was the fun thing but now that we're there we're getting this and i think that kind of i feel like from criterion collection that that probably evolved where we're getting all these extras because i've heard people say like watch all the extras on criterion and you essentially paid for film school. Like, like you kind of said, like yeah. you're learning all these valuable skills and all this, you know, behind the, behind the camera and like inside baseball kind of stuff. So it's like, it's, it's just a valuable resource. So when people are like, right. Oh, but the prices for that stuff is, Oh, it's $30 a release. It's like, yeah, but compare that to a couple hundred dollars for a week of film school or something like that. Exactly. So you are, you're getting, you're getting your bang, a bang for your buck. And, you know, like you're saying, it could send you on other different paths to other things you might really enjoy. So it's, yep. it's pretty awesome that we have that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, completely agree about criterion. I will hats off to them pretty much any day. They are the one that really popularized the commentary. Uh, I will happily throw out that criterion has fallen. I think from their, their high point of yesteryear, which was probably around the early DVD days, uh, which is a long time ago at this point. But nowadays, it's uh, not all that common for them to get a commentary. It's not uh, something where their discs are this big prestige thing. And now we give that to other labels that are stepping up and doing you know, two commentaries on a film from 1961, plus an extended making of documentary interviews with the actors and directors. And it's everything you could possibly wish for. And it's the same price as a criterion. So. Right. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of new kids on the block, if you will, but they, yeah. they're bringing it. So, and we're reaping all the benefits. <laughs> yeah. Competition is the, the best thing for this land. I, uh, I just got that uh, blood guts and sunshine and, uh, with a slip cover, which nice. so I'm a big limited edition guy. If I see limited edition, I'm a sucker. I don't. I, I mean, I buy movies blind, never seen them. I yep. have mo I have probably a hundred movies in there that are still in the plastic wrap. I don't know if I'm the only one, but <laughs> you can probably see more than a hundred behind me that are still wrapped. <laughs> 
Well, it's good to know I'm not the only weird one. Um, <laughs> I, I'm treating this as my retirement plan. I've got two young kids, so I can't watch a lot of these that show a lot of boobs and blood every single day. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. A lot of the things that we like, I mean, cult, uh, horror, or whatever, otherwise, um, yep. you know, that you can't really show to the kids. Uh, I'm waiting for, like, the, the comedy... I, I want some like 80 sex comedies to have nicer releases. You know, I, I just wonder if that'll ever be a thing, which I think it will be. I mean, we're seeing like Vinegar Syndrome doing. Um, uh, Married like to the Mob. Yeah, they did Married to the Mob, which apparently that slipcover went crazy yep. and sold out. And uh, I mean, Texas Chainsaw 2, yes, it's a comedy, but it's mainstream. Or yes, it's a horror. Actually, it's a comedy, too. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, um, you know, it's a mainstream movie. So you're seeing some of these mainstream movies go to these smaller boutique yeah. levels. Well, um, players that are just, I mean, I think it's really cool. Because I remember when Beastmaster came out, I was like, whoa, they got Beastmaster. But now they're getting crazy thing i mean they got rad first but i was gonna say i think the so. first real one i saw you make a change for was rad just because it's like your all-time favorite or whatever and i remember you were like ah <laughs> <laughs> oh i mean yeah I, although i will say this i'm not a fan of that slip cover i i just i i've i'm just not a fan of it i mean you first like off the they Pokemon were all damaged card. Well, you they were like the all damn card foil on it. If, it. if it wasn't so easy to scratch, it would have been nice. Yeah. I mean, I just don't like the the ventricular or whatever they call it. I'm just not a big fan. I would have rather had like, like I love movie slipcovers like Blood Games and uh, some of those that they were doing. I would have liked a more just. I like. I also like when the slipcover is different from the main same. movie. So I don't need a slipcover that has the exact same art on it. <laughs> I just, I don't. <laughs> I mean, that's what you get with like mainstream movies from Walmart and such. Yeah, but. usually. Um, and then there's the other part to consider is that a lot of times they, they literally have to approve all of that artwork. So some of those, they literally can't put anything else on there. Yeah. And it's probably not that, um, not worth the trouble. I mean, if it is a bigger movie. You're probably like, well, just just do the normal one. And Rad was like this mystical being anyway, yep. you know, like it didn't really exist except on my uh I mean I own the VHS, I have the cassette soundtrack, I have a bootleg DVD, <laughs> I have I have uh, the vinyl, <laughs> I have interviewed Bill Allen. Like nice. it's, it's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> Pretty rad. Yeah, literally. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, as we kind of wind down here, Ryan, what are some of the releases that you're kind of looking forward to for the remainder of this year and then going into 2023? Um, <laughs> it's so much. Uh, Name them all. <laughs> every single one, please. Go ahead. I am interested in seeing how some of these other studio catalog 4Ks come out. Uh, it seems to be a fall where we are heavy on the studio catalog 4Ks, and I'm very much invested in 4K. I, I buy everything in 4K the moment I possibly can. Uh, I love most of the 4Ks. However, there is that you know 5 or 7% that they just didn't put that care into, and they don't look that much better. So uh, in November, we are getting a whole bunch of the old like Christmas classic movies in 4K. We're getting Elf in 4K. We're getting uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer in 4K. We're getting A Christmas Story, all those other sort of things. Um, I am just curious to see how they do. Uh, the other big thing is we're getting two new Tarantino 4Ks. And yeah. that was a, a sticking point because Inglorious Bastards came out and a lot of people crept on the 4k restoration but it's it's not as bad as it was made out to be however these are from a different studio so they are probably going to be vastly different if that means they're going to be good or bad time will tell on that front but uh i mean these are kind of important films i just really hope they don't screw the pooch on something like pulp fiction yeah yeah Love especially pulp with pulp all the different releases we've had of it leading up to this point this should be the right. like, penultimate like great one so exactly yeah. I mean, I, I feel like it's one of his best. I do love Kill Bill. Kill Bill is probably my favorite. But um, I'm I'm Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, 100. Oh, right now. and now I I love that movie. 
I, I love it. Um, I don't. The only movie I'm not the biggest fan of is Hate, Hateful Eight, and I've only seen it one time, and I just didn't like that ending. So I need to watch it again and just see. Yeah, but uh, it, it's no fault of his, I guess. <laughs> It's probably more me. Um, yeah, uh, we'll let everybody know where they can find you and what you're up to, and uh, just what's going, what you got coming out in the next little bit. Uh, too damn much. First of all, <laughs> um, <laughs> you can find me Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and podcast all under the name The Disc Connected. Uh, I put out, like I said, a live show every Thursday night for the announcements. Every other Tuesday, we also do a live show just to basically talk like this talk about announce uh not announcements but like films that we've been watching catching up on things i have a co-host that i do that with and then i do all kinds of interviews with people so in the last seven or eight months this has been the big thing on my channel i've gotten directors i've gotten uh big people at labels uh my my favorite part is to get them to come in and react to the announcements for the week with me and so oh, that's cool <laughs> I'll, I'll have like, uh, you know, you're talking about Grindhouse video. I had Mike from Grindhouse come on an episode on Thursday night and, you know, he talked shit about the movies that he hated and <laughs> crazy ones that I'm he loved. Good at that. Uh, but then afterwards, we'd we'd get a little mini interview and just spend some time with Mike talking about, you know, how Amazon's the devil and how people should be, you know, investing in physical media as much as they can and the best way to support him. And it's I don't know. It's just a really good way to, to show the people behind these labels, which we don't get enough. Uh, uh, for example, the, the Radiance Films interview that came out today, they are one of the, the rare examples of a label that is open pretty much about everything. Uh, a lot of these other labels, they don't share what they're facing, what they're struggling with, um, you know, why they made the choices they did. Uh, pretty much everything and Fran ever since he left Arrow Video has shared as much as he possibly could so it's been it's been refreshing to see somebody jump in there and just say you know what everybody deserves to know what's going on yeah that's cool I listen to Severin's podcast um, every once in a while when it comes out it's not like I think it's every month or every other month or something but uh, I find I like it I feel like they're pretty truthful about stuff yep. and, I mean you know websites crashing and stuff um so <laughs> which which is kind of impressive all at the same time right like you can't you know that's where the you know people it, it does suck when websites crash on sales and stuff i don't feel like the sales is are as big as they were a couple of years ago i don't feel like a lot of my friends buy as much because i remember it round rad time and that whole year like it was crazy I mean, I probably yeah. spent five hundred dollars on that sale, and like, and like all the people around me did too. And then every time it just got less and less, and I don't know. Um, but I, I feel like it's starting to pick back up, and uh, we really appreciate you uh, coming on, Ryan. And uh, I urge everybody to watch your channel; it's really cool, and it's got some really good stuff. You like steel books, so that's fun. If, <laughs> if people like steel books, uh, he's he's done some unboxings and stuff but uh yeah thanks ryan once again for coming on thank you happy thanks man and uh jeff until next time i guess they should keep it bloody yeah because somebody has to <laughs>